I was super excited to get to talk to you because uh, you've written some pretty great material and you host your show. And I just kind of wanted to introduce you to our audience. Can you give me a, a quick overview of what it is that you do? Yeah, I coach people to get the competitive edge they need to win in their work and win in their life. Because I don't separate work life from life. You know, we spend more time at work than uh, we do anything else in our lives. And uh, I also believe that we were created to work. And so, uh, you know, I'm writing books, doing daily shows, uh, broadcast interviews, creating digital tools and assessments and products, all for the purpose of giving people the competitive edge to make more money and make more impact. Did you do this before Ramsey Solutions or is this something you've done since joining Ramsey? I did a version of it on the very first uh, installment of the Ken Coleman show that was on talk radio. Uh, I did a version of it. I wasn't as focused, uh, but uh, largely no. Uh, This was something that I wanted to do, but um, needed the platform and the resources to be able to do it. It's very, very hard to do this kind of thing to the scale that I get to do it by yourself. It's very, very hard. Oh, yeah, I know. We've got like 10, 12 people here that help make this show like happen as a whole. You know, the, the research, the structure, the guests, the scheduling, rescheduling. It's a it's a big uh, production. And I got to go see, like if when you walk into your building uh, or the Ramsey building, you can actually see like you through the glass recording your show in the studio. And you can also see like the production team and what, are they like taking live calls? Do you do live calls on your show? Yeah, so my show's live. I do not record. Okay. Uh, the show is, we record the show, but it is a live show. I'm on Sirius XM and radio and we're live on YouTube. And then we take that broadcast and we put it out via podcast. So uh, slight distinction there um, to some listeners or to viewers, but it's a big difference. We don't, everything's live. There is no... Uh, I record this, let's take a break and then come back and record this. All the calls are live. Um, I'm not talking to the callers until they get on the air. We have a call screener and she's talking to them and then she's putting them on live. So um, that's that's the training I come from is live radio and live television. And um, I just personally, I don't like to do a lot of recorded stuff. It's the nature of the game for a lot of folks and I get that and I have to record things. But uh, um Live is my jam. Yes. It's when I'm at my best uh, in that my energy is where it needs to be. The pressure is something that I crave. Um, I perform better with that added pressure of it's live. 100% agree. When the pandemic happened, you know, everybody was lined up for conferences and I was going around before the pandemic doing like, you know, speaking on different conference stages and, you know, the feel of being live and with an audience and all of that. Then they were asking us to uh, like record our talk sitting in front of the camera and send it in and they would play it for a digital conference. I'm like, that is not the same feel. You cannot read the crowd. You cannot understand the energy that's going on. It's just a completely different animal. Yeah, I've I've had people ask me to record talks before and I just say no. Yeah. (laughs) Now, you you can make me go live. I'll go live for five people and you all can record on that end. But I'm not going to just speak to a screen. I just, uh, oh yeah, I, know, I just, just don't like it. It's uh, I'm a, look, look, man. I, I come. From, I'm a I'm a preacher's kid, and so that's the environment I grew up in. And the idea of uh, preparing some thoughts and 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 know where you're going and why you're going there, but then just get up and and speak to people. You know, not perform. Yeah, you have to work on your character a lot. At least I did to, to be comfortable enough to. Because when you're up there, it's sort of like just free flowing out of you based off of you know your experience. So you have to have a really good, solid core, uh, make sure that the right things are coming out. Well, let me tell you the secret to that. You gotta have a you gotta have something in the well to pull something out of it. And so you know anybody could get up there and speak and just throw a bunch of words at you. But if it sounds like word salad, or it's like biting hard into some cotton candy then there's a pretty good indicator that that person doesn't have much in their well. And so you, you mentioned the word character. I, I I think that's right. But I would also say that there needs to be some content that I'm talking like content that comes from a place of 
of conviction is first and foremost. Um, because then you don't have as many problems with words. You know, it's like when I when I believe something deeply, then I I have no problem communicating that because I know what I believe and I know why I believe it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, you know, when I started this show, I was pretty quiet and only had a handful of relationships. And one of the reasons why I started the show was to get more relationships and get to know more people. But people will say, okay, you know, you've done the show for five years, 500 episodes. And I was like, well, yeah, but I mean, I built software and grew software teams for 17 years before that. So like, it's not like I just decided to do a podcast, did some quick reading and joined a software team and then made a podcast about technology leadership. It's like I just lived through it and all the pain of, of doing the wrong things and then figuring out how to get it right. And then you never always get it right, but it's a work in progress. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's every experience that you have um, has something that you can take from it and apply it to something new. And I think that obviously you've done that. So we have a pretty large audience, um, mostly tech leaders. And I figured I'd just bring you on and ask you, like, what what knowledge do you have or or what do you speak to that you think in this brief interaction that we're having with the audience that like, that would bring them the most value possible? Because you have great talks in multiple different areas, but what do you feel like what's on your heart right now? Well, I'll answer that two ways. The first is you need to tell me what your audience wants and <laughs> what your audience's challenges are, and, and, I, and I'll address that. Uh, but but I what I am excited about for any leader, and you, you are obviously technology leaders, so I'm really locked in right now and really fired up about engagement. Um, the Great Resignation is something that your entire audience is aware of. Uh, we just saw the March job numbers. Uh, I'm, I haven't seen April, but in March, we had another 4.5 million people leave their jobs. So now we're close to 30 million people have changed jobs since August of 2021. And people are chasing a paycheck. People are chasing meaning. They're chasing a lot of things. And so the great crisis for American businesses right now is I, I, I can't keep people or I'm having a hard time finding people. And so what we've got right now is is really a function of a healthy capitalistic economy. And that is, in a healthy capitalistic economy, you're always going to have more jobs available than you do people who are unemployed. So, but it gets reported like, oh, the great way, the great jobs gap and all this stuff. And it's like these, these morons in the media, they don't know anything. They really, they really don't. They have no idea because they're all socialists. And it says like, if you're a capitalist, you go, wait a second. In a capitalist society, you're always going to have uh, an entrepreneurial spirit, people creating jobs all the time. If you look every year at the at the amount of uh, businesses that are opened and started, um, this is the nature of, again, capitalism. So prior to the pandemic, February of 2020, I was talking about on my show and we were looking at the numbers and we had historically low unemployment. We're now a little bit below that. Um, so we're in a new historic low and there were more jobs available than there were, than there were, there were people that are unemployed due to a variety of factors. So all that said, in an environment like this, you're going to have people that are leveling up for whatever reason. And so engagement as it relates to performance and profit has always been the number one issue for leaders and always will be. What's changed and what's so uh, why I'm so fired up about this issue now is, is that now engagement and retention of people, so so performance, engagement for performance and profits is still important, but now it's engagement for retention because people have so many more options now and they will leave you in three months. I mean, uh, th there's an article we're going to share on the show next week. Uh, I believe it's in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, in fact, Fox News wants me to talk about it Friday. Uh, and that's that's where it's coming in. I, so I'm going on Fox News to talk about this this article on Friday. They asked me to come on. And it's this idea of people are accepting jobs and then they don't show up on their start day. Wow. And so Fox wants me to comment on it. Well, so one of the reasons that this is happening is, is the job market is so hot. People have so many options that they're saying yes to you, CTO, listener, viewer, 
Okay. And then if their start date is three weeks, 30 days, whatever, 45 days from now, they've got other options. They're either looking for something better, even though they said, yes, they took a good offer from you, but they're still roving. They're still looking. They're not ready to get married to you. Uh, Or a recruiter has reached out to them. And so they said yes to you, but then come wedding day, we got a runaway bride. And, And so all that is where we sit. And so I've been doing a lot of research on the largest engagement study ever done by Gallup. Um, I've developed a talk that I'm giving in two weeks to 3,000 leaders, um, and it's it's called the Six Rules of Engagement. And and so what I'm fired up about is, is that there are three primary needs leaders that every employee has because they're a human. So we first have to understand these three primary needs. They are, number one, we desire, we need to see meaning and purpose in our work. So like we see that this matters to me. I see a greater purpose beyond just my job and my paycheck. Number two, they, we need to be recognized for our unique contribution. That is, you know, Sam, um, Samantha, my amazing publicist right here, like Samantha and I and you needs to hear, hey, Samantha, like your enthusiasm and how you come up with an idea and how you pitch it and you're pushing me to do stuff. I got to tell you, it's really valuable and it's making me better. Like she needs to hear that. It's not, Sam, you're doing a good job. She needs to hear there's something unique about her and her contribution. So that's a human need. The third human need is we need a relationship with our leader. And it's usually in that coach or mentor, you could, you know, you could kind of parse, parcel that out if you want, but it's either that coach or mentor type relationship. People desire that. So this is from the largest research study Gallup's ever done on engagement. And so I looked at the study and those were the three primary needs. And so I'm not going to unpack all this now, but I've developed the six rules of engagement. I'm going to debut it in two weeks. Um, and these are rules that leaders have to have in place if they want to have high levels of engagement and high levels of retention. And and here's the, here's the big takeaway that I'm going to give leaders. I'll give this part away and we can dive into this leaders. Listen to me. If you take care of the people you have now, you understand and meet those three primary needs that I just listed out. If you take care of the people you have, you'll never have to worry about getting the people you need. Now, I'm going to say that again because that is, that's a mouthful. If you take care of the people you have, you won't have to worry about getting the people you need. They will become your greatest recruiting tool. Uh, They will stay with you longer. They will drive greater results. Um, Leaders, you need to understand this. In taking care of those needs, you are giving them through the job you have given them you are giving them a path to a better life. So no worker's going to come to you and say, I want a better life, but they want better jobs. But what they really want is a better life. And when we as leaders can understand those three primary needs and go, wait a second, if I just help a person find a seat on my bus that gives them meaning and purpose, if I recognize them on a regular basis for their unique contribution, if I have a relationship with them, like real relationship to where they trust me, not as their boss, but as a coach that's helping them win and grow in their personal and professional life, you're telling me that, that I won't have to worry about finding and getting and keeping good people. That's what I'm telling you. So that's what I'm fired up about. Dude, that is awesome. I love it. I I was taking notes. I hope you don't mind when I'm looking down on my keyboard. I was just taking notes um, because it's it's really good stuff. And it's so incredibly true. Um, One of the things that pops in my mind is, uh, you know, I find some of the best leadership qualities, they're they're sort of hard to train, right? Like I tell people, you know, become a better person, (laughs) right? Um, And like, if you need a management book, just like, do everything Jesus did. 
<laughs> you're not going to have to worry right. about anything, no bias, nothing like that. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, have you seen in practice people attempt to systemize these three things or is it just more of a, some leaders do it better than others? How do you see it actually play out? You know, I've talked to over 5,000 callers on the Ken Coleman show and it's a mix of people leaving leaders and a mix of people wanting to join leaders. So I have a really unique vantage point. I know what people are, I know why people are leaving and I know what people are looking for. And from that standpoint, I don't see a lot of leaders doing those three things well. I don't see them meeting needs. I, I think there certainly are a lot of great organizations who meet those three primary human needs. I think there are leaders who are very conscious of those needs and are very intentional to meet those needs. I, I certainly believe that's there. But by and large, I mean, you just you just got to look at the data. You, you know, uh, over 50% of workers start looking for a new job within three months. You know, it's been said, I don't know who said it first, uh, but it's true, people don't leave companies, they leave leaders. And and keep in mind, leaders, don't get defensive on what, on what I just said, because many times they leave you not because of what you did to them, but what you didn't do for them. So let me say that again, because that's a very distinct difference. When people leave you, it's not always because something you did to them, like something bad or something you allowed to happen to them that's bad. It's many times what you didn't do for them. And again, back to those three primary needs. You, you didn't help them get in a seat on the bus that that is meaningful and purposeful to them. You didn't recognize them enough or ever for their unique contribution. And you didn't really develop a coach-mentor relationship with them. If those needs aren't met, guess what? They're looking. We humans are needy people. And, and so, you know, that's, that's the deal. So, yeah, I'm sure there's organizations that have systemized that. Um, but um, Have you but, seen yeah, it firsthand? I mean, or? Yeah, I mean, certainly we do it at Ramsey Solutions on some level. I think we need to be better at it. I think we need to be better at it. Um, I've seen great companies. Chick-fil-A does it well. I'm sure Chick-fil-A could be better at it. Um, but no, I've not. I, because this is new content and I'm kind of diving into this research and I've, you know, come at this. I mean, I'm not, I haven't been looking for it to be able to where I could say to you, this company, I give a A plus on this, this, and this. Uh, you know, I mean, there are a lot of companies that do it well. And, and by the way, a lot of companies that do it instinctively because you could take those three primary needs and you could just go, you know, look, if you're a servant leader, there's a good chance you're going to meet those needs. But a lot of servant leaders don't know how to get people in the right seat of the bus. They just know something's off. And so I'm going to recognize them and be good to them, pay them well, um, develop a coach relationship with them. But if you get two out of those three right, you're still susceptible to losing somebody. So you know what I teach, talent, passion, mission, when they're in alignment, the inner threads are allowing that person to experience meaning and purpose because they go, I was born for this. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. And what's running through my head right now is uh, my roster of my company and how much of those three, it's like their gradients, right? I'm about how much I do with each person of those three. And some I know way more about like one thing and I'm not doing the other two. And some I'm kind of like doing all of them like halfway. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's really, it'd be an interesting exercise for me to sit down and do like a one to 10 mm -hmm. on like each one of them. And and, mm -hmm. and then also see how it bakes into our culture. Like I'm just curious to take a sample from like my two of my executives and ask them, you know, like what do you mm -hmm. think you're, scale is for the team and on what you're providing across mm -hmm. these three areas. I think that'd be interesting. I've also seen yep. like a lot of like one-on-one -on -one and team management softwares, things like that. I was like, that would probably be a good place where you could, you know, integrate some of this for, for companies that have that type of workflow. Yeah. You know, I would say in technology companies, it's almost more important to really understand that third and final need in that list. And that's that coach mentor relationship. Um, because the nature of technology work and then the workers that do technology work, these are very smart women and men. I mean, like crazy smart. 
And um, this is no secret. I mean, this bears out in much data. And I've talked to, to people that are in technology training, Bethel Tech. I, I endorse Bethel Tech. You know, I mean, they're teaching soft skills like crazy to a lot of these tech people because tech people, a lot of them, not all of them, uh, tend to be a little bit weak in the area of soft skills and people skills. The good news is, is you can develop those. Um, and I, I just think it's really important that that uh, there is a, and again, this is to your direct report. So I wouldn't expect you as the CEO to have this with everybody in your company. I would expect you to meet those three needs of your direct reports. Correct. And then your direct reports need to meet the needs, those three needs of their direct reports. Um, and so, um, I, but I will say because of the nature of the isolation and the quiet work or the deep focused work that happens in a lot of technology companies and technology work, um, even if a person is an extreme introvert and just wants to watch Star Wars during their lunch break, you got to reach out to them. And you got to find a connection to them um, and develop some type of coaching mentor relationship uh, with them to where they feel like my leader really wants me to win. Yes. It's not about his wins or her wins. It's not about the company wins. They want me to win because they realize when I win, the rest of it takes care of itself. How do you think about people who... Uh, like don't know what they want. One of the things I ask in my interviews when I'm bringing on new employees, like a job interview type stuff, I'll ask them, you know, tr I'll try to figure out through the conversation what their, you know, purpose is and what they're, what's driving them is, you know, do they have a, a, a family and like right now it's family mode or are they trying to really grow their career? Like where is their attention and what are they going after and what do we need and how do those line up? But I do find, um, and it's kind of a turnoff when people have like, they're, they're really like lost and you can tell that they have no idea like what they want or what's driving them. And they're just kind of like floating through. Um, what do you, what do you think about that? Well, from my experience, uh, again, they're talking to over 5,000 people on the air and probably several hundred more in live events where they're just asking me a question in front of thousands of people. And I'm just boom, right there. Um, I don't believe that they don't have any idea. Um, I don't believe it. It's like when somebody tells me, I have no idea what I want. Um, I don't believe them um, because I know they have ideas. Um, the, the way the brain works, like the brain can't help but come up with pictures. So what they're really saying, they're not being dishonest. What they're really saying is, I don't know how to say it or I don't know how to describe it in a way that's confident or coherent or I'm a little ashamed of it or this is what I want, but I don't know if it's realistic. Those are the emotions or the actual negative thought that is underneath the expression of, I don't know what I want. And I mean, I've tested it. I've done it live on the air when people are super nervous. I'll just say, yeah, you do. Let me just ask you again. Let me throw it this way. What would you do if you knew it wouldn't go wrong, but you also didn't have to commit to it the rest of your life, right? And there was no risk at all, no risk of criticism, no risk of failure, no risk of whatever. And I said, and here's what I know. You've already come up with one or two things while I was setting you up. I was giving your brain the actual freedom to formulate a thought. And while I've been setting it up, and even now while I'm talking, you have the idea, now say it, go. Uh, Every time I do that, they spit it out. That's amazing. So it's it's psychology, dude. It's it, 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 They have an idea. In fact, the issue isn't that they don't have the idea. It's that they don't have confidence in the idea. Yep. What if it changes? Like, does it, like people, they go throughout their life and they'll want different things. And do you think that they'll have something that they want and then that'll, they won't pursue it? And it'll go away and then something new will come along? Or do you think it's just like that one static thing their whole life? No, I think our wants change all the time. Okay. But I will tell you this, that I think that there's not much change in the foundation of the want. So the specifics of the want might change. But the foundation behind the want doesn't change very Dude, much. Dude, Ken, you are brilliant, man. 
<laughs> well, I'm not sharing that. a lot of stuff. Can we running. record that and have him? Yeah. And have, can I play that tonight with my high schoolers? Yeah. I, got, I, got teenagers that, I got teenagers that think I have zero sense at all. Oh um, my goodness. Yeah, do you understand what I mean when I say that? Yeah. It, so for instance, let's say, let's say you want a certain car. You, you, you want a classic car or sports car or whatever like that. And so you want it for a long time and then you don't get it or whatever, whatever. And then, and then you're like, okay, I don't, I don't want that car, but I, I now I want this car. And it seems like totally different cars, and they are totally different cars. So your want has changed. You wanted this car, now you want a Harley. And so, and I'm making up a silly example to to make sure people understand what I just said. So the specific want changed, but what was underneath that want hasn't changed. And what they want is they want a status symbol. They want some freedom. They want a fun toy. You know, that's what I'm getting. At. Specifics change that foundational thing behind the desire, yeah, I don't see that changing much. Uh, you're a pastor's kid. Um, does the Bible talk about these things like status and other core needs of the person? Sure. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I can't think of a scripture that just pops in the top of mind about status, but, you know, we, um, certainly we long for fleshly desires, you know, um, there's no question about that. And, and let's also, let's also, you know, point out here that um, we were created to desire, you know, like when it all started out, it's Adam in the Garden of Eden and everything's perfect. Biggest apples you've ever seen in your life. You know, like everything's perfect. It's beautiful. And, and God created Adam to enjoy creation. So, you know, God created us to enjoy him in relationship, but also in his creation. You know, so it's like we believe the Bible, then it's all going to be restored again, a new earth where everything's perfect, there's no pain. And boy, that sounds like a big, giant freaking enjoyment to me. Yeah. So we are created to desire and to have those desires met, but the desires were supposed to be whole and wholesome and pure, not fleshly and carnal. So um, we we... It's okay to dream. God is the God of dreams. He, he's the dream giver, you know? Um, and so we got to be okay with that. What we always have to check ourselves with is what's, what's the foundation? What's the source of the vision, the source of the desire? All right. So I'm just going to like run stuff by you now. <laughs> <laughs> because right, yeah, sure. yeah, you're like great at this. All right. So this is something that happened to me a couple, probably about two or three years ago. Um, and I feel like I, I figured it out. All right. But I want you to tell me what you think when you hear it. Um, so the show started to get popular and I started getting like all these cool guests that I wanted to have on. And these people that like I never in a million years thought would talk to me, like, you know, the creator of the internet and all of this. And then the show started making money and it became my like full-time job. And so now I'm doing this thing that was like crazy. And all of a sudden, um, you know, I've talked to, I couldn't think of a bigger name of a person I wanted to talk to than the creator of the internet. So after that interview, I just noticed like I kind of started to get depressed uh, because like I had this th vision, this dream that I thought would take me a lifetime to achieve. And it took me like two or three years to achieve and then it took me a while to find like another another goal um, to sort of like pull me out of that. Um, what are your thoughts on on that experience? You were achieving for the wrong reasons. You were achieving the interview of the uh, creator of the internet as this massive thing that you would be recognized for. And then once you did the interview, you closed the the MacBook or whatever, you stopped recording or whatever, and it was over. And then you were like, oh, that was so amazing. And you had all this build up to the interview. You were so excited. You told everybody, hey, um, I can't believe this. I got the uh, uh, the creator of the interview of the internet. It's great. And you were all excited. You're so geek. You do the interview. You have this moment of reflection right after the interview's on. You're like, that's amazing. I can't believe I did that. And then you're like, oh, I got to take the garbage out tonight. Your life didn't change. And when your life didn't change because of that really significant thing, and it is a significant thing, um, and, and you realize that your life hadn't changed, that you hadn't changed, 
you did accomplish something really cool, but it didn't change anything. And that's where that depression came in. Cause you're like, well, what, what's like, oh, I got, now I, I was living for that high. I achieved the high, the high wore off. Now what? And so what I mean by you are chasing achievement for the wrong reason, and I'm not criticizing you. You asked no, me please, to analyze this. Please, please. Yes. Um, I, I think what's happening is, is you were, what was behind that achievement was recognition. Some for yourself. Hey, I, I, I pulled this off. This, this is a big deal. Um, recognition from others, whatever. Instead of going after that interview, getting that interview, um, conducting that interview, delivering that interview for the significance of influencing others, which I think is something you want to do. But I think you were so focused on the achievement part and the recognition part that it just is a natural, it's kind of fallen off the sugar high. That's my take. That's my analysis based on what you've just presented to me. I don't, you can tell me if that's right or wrong, but no, I, mean, I think it's pretty it, you know, spot on. That's what I see. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, you said it in a surprisingly accurate way. Like, you know, it was the buildup of doing the different interviews, getting bigger and bigger people, and then sort of crescendoing at that. And um, shortly after that, I, you know, was doing like a lot of reflection and, and things. And I ended up, uh, be- at that point in time, when I was doing those interviews, I was working 12, 16 hours a day going crazy, had been doing that for two years. I started my business right when I had my first child. So I basically was like abandoning my wife and kids. I mean, you know, I just wasn't spending time with them while I was building this business. And after that interview, I realized like, you know, business was stable and growing and I had done everything. And so I, I um, bought a family car so I could drive my kids to school. So like within like a couple of weeks of that, uh, I just completely changed everything about like my marriage and my kids and just spending more time and like no longer working weekends and stopping my work day at five. And this past two years or so since that moment have been the best, like my wife and I are just one crazy best mm-hmm. friends. Like, uh, it's everything is everything changed. So it was like a interesting moment for me, but I think you're right. I think what happened was I realized some way I didn't I don't think I was super conscious of it but I I realized that like that was not the fulfillment and I was chasing that for a while um here's and, what it is yeah you ready I just got the thought you were all about the get and not the give and when we're all about getting something from our profession or from our relationships it's always going to be hollow and empty because you can't satiate. We humans are almost impossible to satiate. So when our mindset and our focus is on on getting, 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 it's just like you can't stop. When your focus is on giving, you are so fulfilled. And so in some ways, you started giving more of yourself to your family and you saw happiness increase and everything else. So I think you were just about, and by the way, welcome to the race. This is the human race. Uh, but I think you were more about the get and not the give. And then when you focus this show and anything you do on what we're giving to our audience, to our customer, uh, boy, it it sure does feel better. Yeah. That's a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you you did. Boy, I tell you, you put yourself on the hot seat, man, asking me to analyze you. But that's what I see. Oh, and and I mean, I think that that's, by the way, that's very normal. But do you see the difference? Yeah, I mean, I it was it's a massive shift. I will push a little bit back that like one of the the things that excited me about the get was that you know what I do is I bring the leaders on and like try to extract their best information right for the audience. But at the same yeah, time, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say the get, it was all about how great the guests are, how big the audience is, and, and my point is it's just a slight shift between. You know what I mean? Between me, like, for instance, if I'm not careful, I, I have to be careful that I'm not like, am I getting enough attention? Am I getting enough a media request? Am I getting enough likes? Am I get? And I start to measure success based on that if I'm not careful, S- certainly in my world. And so I've got to, I have to always be on guard for that to where it's like, okay, are we giving? Are we giving? Remember, Ken, all of this ancillary praise and all of this validation 
is nothing more than validation that what you're giving is working. But don't get hung up in the validation. You see what I mean? Yeah. And that, so I'm, I'm preaching to myself on that. So I, I totally understand what you're saying. You yeah. were getting good conversations. You were getting good answers and all that stuff. That's great. But it's what you personally are getting out of it. Yeah, I was, I was not giving where I needed to be giving in my life, mm-hmm. uh, which was to my family. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was so focused on getting all this information for the audience and like doing all this stuff. I wasn't, I wasn't focused at all on, on, on those relationships. And it was, um, so I, that happened, got depressed for a couple of weeks, started talking about it with guests, like, you know, Hey, I'm experiencing this. What do you think? And so I, when you say hot seat, I've lived like my past five years, like, <laughs> I don't, I'm fine with it. Um, but you know, Making that change with my family um, was a huge deal. And I had heard at the time that someone had said something along the lines of like, you can't be popular, like famous to the world until you're famous to your city. You can't be Mm -hmm. popular at your Mm -hmm. city level until you're popular within your community. You can't do that until you're popular within your family. And you can't do that until you're popular within your household. And so I said, all right, I was trying to just like go up there, you know, create something really big and great. And I realized that there was, there was no foundation to it. Like step one, Mm. I had to go build my relationship with my wife and my kids. Step two, I had to start mixing in my, my brothers and my sisters and all all of that good stuff. And, and step three, I got involved with my church more um, and, and started serving there and, and having community there. And then to be honest with you, uh, just focusing on those and the other things sort of just through the past two years, two to three years of just focusing on those, I mean, we've doubled, tripled the show and I haven't even been paying attention to that. That's awesome. Uh, Let's plug your book. (laughs) You've got a couple books, right? Yeah. uh, The latest is From Paycheck to Purpose, where I unveil the seven stages for anybody who's trying to figure out what is my unique role in work? Is there purpose in work? How do I answer the age old question? What should I do with my life? Well, this book is written for that person to help them answer the question or help them verify the answer that they've thought for a long time and maybe others have poo-pooed it. So that's the book in a nutshell. There's seven stages, get clear, get qualified, get connected, get started, get promoted, get the dream job, give yourself away. So this idea of true actualization of our purpose is where we get to a place in our dream job, which the dream job is defined where I'm spending most of my day doing what I'm really good at, doing what I really enjoy, and producing results that matter really deeply to me. That's the definition of a dream job. And uh, so when I'm there, uh, and I've been there for a while, um, I found that there's no income issues there. And so then it's all focused on impact. So that's the latest book from Paycheck to Purpose. And We've got a great assessment called the Get Clear Career Assessment. I would say to leaders, we've got a a B2B version of that assessment, which will allow a person to know what their top talents are, their top passions, which is work they enjoy, and then their primary mission, which is what motivates them. What result do you want to put out there in the world? Um, And I would mention that assessment is a great engagement tool for, for small business owners, companies, large companies, where, um, We use this as an awareness and an engagement tool. So these are some of the fun resources that we're developing from that methodology that everybody's got that sweet spot where they use what they do best, talent, to do work they love, passion, to produce results that matter to them, mission. Those are the three threads that we all have within us. And when those are all in sync and tightly woven together, you know, I mean, it's, uh, that's, that's what God intended for us. Is this assessment publicly accessible today? Yeah, KenColeman.com. Please go us. Please go publicly access it. Please, my kids need shoes. Yeah. <laughs> do you have to? Do you have to be an entrepreneur to do this, or can you do this within no, nine to five? No, 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 no. That book is that book is written really for anybody who is again not where they want to be in their work. You know, I mean, it's could be a leader. You know, I mean this this methodology works for leaders. You know, are you in your leadership sweet spot? So here's the question for leaders. How many of you leaders that are watching or listening to this conversation are spending at least 75% of your day 
using what you do best, doing work you love, producing results that matter to you. If you aren't, you aren't in your leadership sweet spot. It's time for you to hire for it, delegate it, or remove it. It creeps up on you too, especially like... Oh, let me tell you something. You want to know the single big... I believe this is the single biggest factor to you as a leader maximizing yourself for the growth of your company because you as the leader are always the lid. If you aren't in your leadership sweet spot, you are limiting your company's growth. And I'm just going to tell you, rule of thumb, 75% of your day, week, month, year... You ought to be spending 75, minimum 75% of your time doing stuff you're really good at, doing stuff you really love to do, and producing results that matter deeply to you. As the leader, that, and if you do that, then you're going to start demanding your other leaders do that. Mm-hmm. This is the true measurement of efficiency and excellence. And watch your company just skyrocket. But leaders are walking around with all these blind spots. And by the way, the leader's the last person to know this. Every person on your team knows if you're not in your sweet spot. They can tell you if you had the guts to ask. By the way, so so like when you figure it out, announce it to them, they're like, well, well, we kind of (laughs) knew. Yeah. I'd say I'm pretty good. I wasn't for a while, but uh, sort of like an investor mentor of mine uh, had stepped in and, and saw me sort of like, he met me and I was in my sweet spot and then he saw me fall out of mm-hmm. my sweet spot and I didn't have awareness of the sweet spot at, at this point in time. And he pulled me sure. aside and he said, hey, we need to put a recurring event in your calendar like every three months for you to ask yourself the question like, you know, is there anything you should be delegating? Are you doing what you love? Um, that's literally what the title of the event says is like, are you doing what you love um, and what you're good at? And so every every quarter, that little alarm goes off. So if I, you know, we're human, right? If I If I mess up or I get over... Um, over that that threshold, or you know, of the twenty five percent of doing things I don't want to do, then we have to uh, reevaluate. And I think little things will creep up. Like right now, we're you know looking for someone. Like a, a role, a need popped up. It rose up, but you don't know if it's going to be like permanent need. So like I took that, and then it started to grow. And I'm like, okay, this is a thing. And now we're hiring for it. And so you know, it, it's not perfect all the time, but. I don't want it to be like I get hammered down to where I'm only doing what I love 20% of the time and I start to fall out of love with the company and it starts to die. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You cover up that flame. But again, the good news is it's like a pilot light. It never goes out. Yeah. yeah. You can certainly cover it up. But again, you retreat back to clarity. And that simple formula that I just gave is a, is a wonderful tool. So that assessment will help leaders individually who if they feel like something's off mm-hmm. for me, uh, they'll get a purpose statement out of that based on their top three talents. It'll show where they score on the 12 universal talents. It'll show them their top three passions, the type of work they love, and it'll show them where they score on the rest of the 15. And then there's six primary missional drivers. So this speaks to motivation, which by the way, you can, ne- you can never motivate yourself, nor can you motivate anybody else. But when you know what motivates you, which they call intrinsic motivation, uh, means that you're not uh, forced to do it. You're not rewarded to do it. You just do it because you want to. That's what we show you in this assessment. Your primary mission is the results that you most want to put into the world. And so it's a wonderful little assessment. It's 20 minutes. Um, if you got any leaders that aren't quite sure, am I in my leadership sweet spot? That'll tell you. And you'll get a purpose statement that reads out with those top three. And and you can sit down with your assistant or yourself Uh, your close leaders that are serving with you. And you can look at that purpose statement and go, oh, okay, here's where I need to make some adjustments. Yes, so the link to that, everybody, is in the description. Uh, KenColeman.com. It'll be in the store. Yeah, it'll be in the store. And it's called the Get Clear Career Assessment. And again, for leaders, they know what career they want to be in. So, you know, you could ignore the professional possibilities that we give for the general consumer who's trying to figure out what does a career path look like. But what you're really getting it for is that that purpose statement and a detailed look at talent, passion, and mission. Nice. And I've gotten, I wish I could just convey my entire experience of, you know, hanging out with Brandon and tour, touring the uh, whole 
Ramsey facilities and all the great mm-hmm. people you have there. And I got to see you guys were building the the event that um, you and Brendan were doing was being built on this wall. And there's like all these brilliant people with these topics and it all was like organized. And I was like, man, the operation here is like, it is world class. It was, it's rarely do I find places where I say if I wasn't an entrepreneur, I would work there. This is, that is, Ramsey is one of them. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. a, you know, Dave Ramsey's a unicorn. And uh, as a result, we are uh, in many ways a unicorn type company. Last question here. Um, mm-hmm. Stood out to me a lot. How do you tell the difference between a dream and a mirage? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, we unpack this in detail in the book. Um, the short answer is, um, you know, if you remember the the old classic cartoon, Saturday morning cartoon, Daffy Duck, and he's dragging his tongue along the desert floor and he's he's seemingly you know stuck in this endless desert and he looks up ahead and he sees this unbelievable oasis and he his little duck feet turn into fast spinning wheels and he runs and he gets up to it and he jumps up in the air in the swan dive and he thinks he's about to land in this beautiful little pond in the middle of the desert and boing, 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 you know it's like his beak hits the ground and he realizes it's a mirage and so we need to make sure that uh, coming back to that simple formula, again, I unpack it much deeper and in more of a process uh, in the book. So I'll leave you to to, to dive into that. But um, the dream is something that we can verify easily by going back and saying, does this allow me to spend the majority of my time using what I do best, my talents as premium tools, to do stuff that makes me come alive. It, it, my heart soars, it swells, time passes quickly. That's passion. And it is allowing me to produce results that I believe are legacy. If not, it's probably a mirage that it looks really shiny, it looks really awesome. But when you actually get there, it's just another part of the desert. And that's the analogy there. Whereas the dream is a manifestation of that vision of who I want to be, what I want to do, and where I want to do it. And it is when you run it through the test of talent, passion, mission, and if it's not checkmark, 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 then it's not a dream, it's a mirage. That's the short answer. We go into much deeper classification in the book, but for sake of time, yeah, I, I want to give the analogy there. But that's how we know, because a mirage is nothing more than an illusion. It's an illusion. We think it's what we want, but it's not. And how do we f- discover that it's not a mirage? We get closer to it, and the closer we get to it, we see, oh, that was a literally an optical illusion. It actually happens. But how do we do it? Close examination. That's the answer. And I showed you just a, a smidge of how to closely examine that. Yes, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that see the mirage and they walk around it constantly looking at it and never actually try to walk no. up to it. That's right. Don't go jumping in like Daffy Duck. <laughs> oh, I think that's a good good way to end it. That's my favorite leadership advice ever. Don't there jump in is. like Daffy Duck. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. And, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing because you're talking directly to leaders. You're equipping leaders. And I certainly have a passion for that. And uh, if I or Ramsey Solutions in any way can help you or your company, uh, I come and speak to companies. We can take that assessment and bring it to you, turn it into an engagement tool and, and consult or guide leaders on that. So we, um, we need leaders and we need really good leaders. There's not a whole lot of them. And so uh, to the extent that we can help and hopefully this conversation has encouraged you. So thank you all for what you all do.